Delwitz. Uh, I'm the artistic director emeritus of Woolly Mammoth Theater in Washington, DC. And now I am associate director of the Center for International Theater Development. And I wanna thank um, CITD's director, Philip Arnaud, as well as uh, BJ Matthews and Thea Rogers of HowlRound for encouraging the, this event and uh, making it possible. So I um, absolutely love this book. I don't know what you'll get out of seeing, seeing the cover. Um, uh, proclaiming presence from the Washington stage. I am so excited to help uh, introduce it to you, but I am especially honored to be joined today by the author of the book, Blair Rubel, and by not one, but two distinguished professors from Georgetown University, Maurice Jackson and Soyika Diggs Colbert. Um, why don't each of you just take a moment to introduce yourself and then we'll dive right into the book. Um, Soyika? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Suika Colbert. I am the interim dean of the College of Georgetown University. I'm also the Idol Family Professor in Performing Arts and African American Studies. And I also serve as Associate Theater Director at Shakespeare Theater in Washington, DC. Um, I'm Maurice. I'm Maurice Jackson. I teach uh, 18th century history in, in, uh, in Washington and jazz history at uh, Georgetown. And I've uh, had the opportunity to work on Blair on any, a number of projects, especially a recent book on uh, jazz in Washington. And I'm finishing up a book uh, in about a week on, on some aspects of history of Black Washington. So I'm honored to be here. And uh, Blair. Blair, I'm Blair Rubel. I'm the uh, author and I'm a scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington. And you're the author of, uh, of many, many books. Uh, many books on Washington, correct. On Washington and on and on urban urban history and the intersection of urban history and the arts, um, in in particular and culture. Um, well, um, thank you all for being here. I am I'm I feel overmatched and honored <laughs> um, because I don't have the depth of uh, historical knowledge that uh, that any of you have, but I I had some tiny overlap with the events and some of the people in this book, so I'm uh, happy to be to be part of this. Blair, why don't you get us started? Um, and, um, you know, I've been working in DC for, as I said, for about four decades. And I have to say this book gave me an entirely new perspective on the ground that I stood on for all that time and didn't know. Um, and I think it was because of the way it links together a number of different stories about theater in the nation's capital during the 20th century. So why don't you start by giving everyone a brief thumbnail of the four major stories in the book and what gave you the idea to write about them side by side? Well, thank you, Howard, and thank you all for uh, listening. Maybe I'll begin with uh, where the idea came from. As Maurice mentioned, uh, we had um, been co-editors of a, a major project uh, producing a history of jazz in DC. And one of the, the observations I took away from that effort was that uh, the arts in DC, like much in DC, always end up appearing to be less than the sum of their parts. That uh, somehow uh, there's, there's an absence of interest or respect at real accomplishment that comes out of the city. And as an urban historian who's been looking at DC, that has, has captured my interest. And about a decade ago, I wrote a history of U Street. And when I was working on that project, I kept bumping up against figures from Howard University in the performing arts. And I, I, they're, in, they're in my book, but I kind of put it aside. And when I had a moment, I thought, I'll go up to Howard and see what's up there. And I went up to Moreland Spring Guard Collection and the um, Howard Library, and there's a wealth of archival material. Most particularly the papers of Thomas Montgomery Gregory who was the founder of uh, the Howard Players. So uh, through Gregory and uh, Elaine Locke and others involved in that story, uh, I began to see um, some very interesting um, uh, develop developments which I didn't understand. And they were emphasized when I was fortunate to uh, make, make the acquaintance of Gregory's daughter, uh, Sylvia Thomas, who is still living in Washington. And one of the things that struck me in the documentation around the founding was an explicit reference to the Irish National Theater. 
And um, I didn't expect that. Uh, and the, the reference really is important. This is the theater that Yates and uh, Lady Gregory founded about 20 years before. And it was to tell Irish stories written by Irish authors to Irish audiences performed by Irish artists without being um, passing through uh, the pens of others. And that image uh, really stuck with Gregory in particular. And then I later noticed that um, I wanted to put the Howard material in context. And I looked around and Catholic was obviously a major player. So I started looking at the Catholic story and- Catholic University, the, you mean? Catholic University. And yeah. in the 1930s, uh, Father Hartke and others wanted to create a national Catholic theater based on the national Irish theater for the same reason uh, of uh, being able to tell their own stories. And I thought, this is interesting, number one. And number two, I, I, I've, I'm unaware of people drawing connections between the Howard experience and Catholic experience because Jim Crow segregation played such an important role in the city. So that kind of led me forward in the uh, Catholic story uh, flows directly into the development of Arena Stage, where uh, Father Harkey helped the Fitch Handlers get started. And they wanted to tell the story of a theater outside of Washington and be recognized for, outside of New York. And they wanted to be recognized for regional theater. And then we end with Robert Hooks and the DC Black Rep, which is uh, in the 1970s and a very, very interesting experiment, far more successful than uh, the way it's usually discussed. So that's the through line of how these different groups chose to use theater as a way of representing themselves and proclaiming their presence in the city. Um, you know, the, the, um, it, what's one of the things that struck me in the book was just how big the dreams of all these people were. Um, the idea of a national black theater, uh, the idea of a national sort of Catholic theater or a, a national network of Catholic theaters, the idea of the whole regional theater movement. Um, and so one, they, one of the obvious questions, and this is for all of us too, I mean, what, what is it about the nation's capital that sort of inspires these huge dreams? Is it just the fact that it's the nation's capital. I know that's one of the things that drew me here as a theater maker, but, or, or is it something different, you know, something else? What's going on here that kind of creates the unique environment for these very big dreams? Well, I, I, I wanna hear uh, from uh, Maurice and Saika, but let me uh, get us started. I think it is the fact that it's a national capital. You know, Washington, um, is divided between hometown Washington and nation's capital and all sorts of people who come here always want to end up playing on the national stage. Uh, it's also on the border between North and South and clearly there's a deep racial divide as well. So these divisions inform all the theater and all the arts that take, that take place here. Plus um, you have the added dimension that Washington uh, uniquely uh, demonstrates, which is there was no political life here at all uh, during the most of the period of the book. And home rule only comes in uh, the mid 1970s. And even then is very limited. So theater becomes, I think, a substitute for political discourse. But those are just my thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the piece that I would add in that I think something the book highlights really well is the way that universities contributed to we would now understand as the regional theater scene. And so Howard became this hub for um, Harlem Renaissance artists who couldn't get produced um, in New York to have their work produced because you had who we understand now as these canonical figures um, in black arts helping to produce essentially and helping to steward along these young writers work. And you know the other figure um, that I would add to the mix um, is Georgia Douglas Johnson who had a salon on S Street and who, would it, to, to Blair's point, um, artists from, there were artists living in DC who would participate in the salon and who she helped to nurture alongside other folks at Howard in terms of producing their theater. But then there are also artists who lived in New York or who lived in the South who would migrate up and down to participate in the salon as well. And so you've got this cross traffic from North to South 
in Washington, D.C., located as a hub where there could be some support for this work during the Harlem Renaissance period. And so although scholars often call this period in the 20s the Harlem Renaissance or the Chicago Renaissance, if you're talking about theater, D.C. was really the space to be. And it was in part because or may, a large part of that was because of the um, support that Howard University provided in cultivating and then producing um, theatrical works. Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. I think that, you know, when you went back to the, the, the point about um, about Ireland, you, you know, Frederick Douglass went to Ireland a long time ago and he became somewhat of a national hero there. And so there was that connection. And then, of course, you had the Civil War and the uh, and support of the uh, 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 of the Irish people for that. The connection just kept coming. In Washington D.C., it was Howard University. You remember that the Fifth Jubilee Singers went to uh, to Europe in 1868. The Howard Singers went not long afterward. Uh, uh, they introduced themselves to Europe. Europe introduced themselves uh, to Howard. At Howard, Frederick Douglass's son uh, taught uh, music there. So you had this uh, 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 this big input long before the theater. And then with this came, this uh, uh, this revelation, I, th I think so you can, is, is quite right. The other day I took a class on a walking tour of U Street. And there we walked at 1461 uh, S Street, which was the, uh, the home of the Saturday Nighters. And this is where George Douglas Johnson uh, uh, had of people. I, I should say this, it somewhat makes you mad because the house now is worth $1.4 million. And so it's been gentrified outside the existence of anybody of any black people coming to the city. This is part of the, the, the thing that Blair uh, sort of ends up with. So you had this unique connection and, and, and perhaps it is right, this, this Renaissance hit Washington before it hit uh, in many ways, New York with, Doug, uh, with Duke Ellington and people like that uh, who, who came in. Uh, the other thing is, 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 is this, and I, I think it's essential to, to, uh, to Blair's book. It, it, it offers a unique look at the at the innermost uh, uh, sanctions of African Americans. In essence, all of us are not the same. We don't think the same. We don't act the same. We don't look the same. We have different cultures, but we all like the arts. And so, even though people are as different as other peoples are, they come together around the thing, and that is uh, for enjoyment. Can I just add one other thing? Um, and this Please. is to, um, Maurice's point about the diversity that's represented in the book. One of the other things I think is a great contribution is that it covers such a long period of time. And so in a lot of scholarship, we see some focus on the Washington DC theater scene in the 1920s or conversations around arena stage um, as it pertains to the development of regional theater scene. But what the book does is draw connections to how those events um, built on one another or on relationship to one another in the context of Washington DC. And so I do think that that's an important um, contribution and it goes back to your point around why DC, what's going on here, what is special about this city in terms of ha um, cultivating theater. Yeah, some of them, uh, to your point, so because I think some of the most exciting moments in the book are when there's a connection between the four different stories, like when Father Hartke helps the, the Fitch Handlers and Ed Mangum uh, uh, rent the hip, their first space at the Hippodrome Theater, or when Robert Hooks goes and sits down in, in Zelda's office and talks about, you know, his hopes to form the uh, the DC Black Rep and and how uh, uh, how Arena might or might not be able to uh, help. Those are like your mouth drops at those because because it, it, everything so much in Washington can seem like these parallel worlds that don't connect, but around these figures they 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 did often connect. Actually, if I can make a pick up and, and make a point on this. Um, I was actually surprised at all the connections that are interwoven and, and you get out of beyond uh, the Second World War, uh, Harkey is pushing uh, to integrate audiences and Jim Crow, you begin to get one of the mysteries or one of the tragedies of the story is that there wasn't more connection between Catholic and Howard since they were they're right next door to one another, but those connections uh, begin to be made, but but because we think of this history in such a fragmented way, and we don't make the connections, we really lose sight of the larger importance of this story. I was talking to a colleague recently, and and uh, I was describing the book, and he said, "Well, I didn't know Howard University had any uh, theater department or contributed to drama until until recently," and I said, well, a dozen of the people in the Howard chapter 
are on U.S. postage stamps. These, right. these aren't local characters. These are major figures in the, the development of American culture. But because the stories get told separately, they, they get diminished in some ways, I think. I want to go back to something you said a little earlier, Blair, about the arts. Um, and I think you referenced it, Maurice, too, the arts as uh, almost a surrogate for political action. I'm not sure if I'm expressing that right, but because of the lack of home rule and the peculiar features of the nation's capital, you know, taxation without representation, um, uh, that the arts have a special kind of role. Is there, uh, can you all help me, un uh, you know, understand that? Does it, how does that play out? I mean, that kind of, uh, you know, movement from one to the other. It, it, I think in the, in the book, right at the beginning, you announced that story with the, um, you know, with the, uh, uh, the anti-lynching plays like Rachel are like the very beginning of your book and they are responding to the Jim Crow policies of the Wilson administration and then uh, that, the, and, and the beginnings of the Howard Theater Department connect to the NAACP. So we see those connections right at the beginning of the story, but uh, how do they play out over time? Well, I think um, the book starts there because I think there are important connections and they're explicit. Yeah, going through uh, the archives, I mean, the, initially the impulse to promote black theater in Washington came in response to the Wilson administration and the Wilson administration's attacks on, on, on black Washington, uh, quite explicit attacks. Um, and there really wasn't any way for these viewpoints to be expressed from within Washington, not only did you have the standard Jim Crow limits on, on voting, but there, there, you had no political life. This was a, a city run by Congress. And then it begins to follow through. And, and you see in the lead up in the debates about home rule, uh, Zelda Fitch Handler at Arena is really wrestling with some of the issues that swirl around home rule. So I, mm -hmm. I, I think, and Maurice, uh, you can talk about this more eloquently than I do. Music is another sphere where um, the Washington DC community, largely the African-American community, but not only, found a way to express political points of view it, when they had no vote, they had no, there was no political, local political organization. Well, you know, I, I, I... I think that's part of, but, but, but I think that, that these, these actions are part of a national trend. And I don't know if it mattered whether we had state or not, or city ruler. Let me just give you an example. Uh, it, it, uh, Archibald Grimke wrote a poem on 13 Negro soldiers, I think 19, uh, when Brownsville, when soldiers were killed. W.B. Du Bois, the great black leader, was against publishing it. You see, uh, 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 they were different opinions about how he expressed himself. The Klan comes to Washington, and when the Klan comes to Washington, black people see in Washington see exactly what they are doing. They have this silent march, and I think this is part of a national trend because people are, are demonstrating all over. The Congress refuses to pass an anti-lynching law, so black people in Washington become very active in this. It's part of a national uh, 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 trend. I think it's it's true of police brutality. It's true of other things uh, uh, too. Wilson, of course, Wilson. As Blair points out, is you know his his roommate wrote uh, "Birth of a Nation." It was racism uh, 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 from day one in every aspect of, of of black lives. But people were separated because you remember now the people who go into the theater, the black theater, aren't working. Not at first, they aren't regular. They aren't working class people. The, the theater for black people is as bifurcated as it is uh, 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 for others. It reflects the nature of the arts. The theater does. Other arts uh, 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 may be a bit different. So it's, again, it shows that complexity. Yeah. I would just, you know, I would say that I think though that there are some pockets within that. I mean, this goes back to the salon and some other non-commercial spaces where theater takes place that, that, um, that puts a little bit of pressure on that in terms of, you know, who can enter into the space and who can produce. But I, I would also agree with Maurice that one of the things that's great about the theater production, particularly in the early 20th century, is that there are a lot of different diverse points of view that get expressed um, in the artwork um, around political questions. And it becomes a space where um, black artists can intervene, but many of those same figures are also 
participating in what we might call activist work or writing op-eds or writing in local newspapers. And so that they have different outlets in addition to their theater making to express their political views. Yeah, I mean, and, and historically we see that in gr groups like the group theater in the 30s, where so many of them were involved in different political activities at the same time that they were involved in theater making to express their ex express their political point of view. Do you, uh, for those of you who are longtime DC, we're, we're all longtime DC theater goers. I mean, I feel as though politics shows up more on the DC stage than it does on the stage in New York or probably any other city in the country. Am I right? Do you, what, what are your thoughts about that or, or how maybe that has played out historically? Well, I, I think um, so much of DC life revolves around politics. I think there is there's a definitely a, a segment of DC theater that is directly connected with the political. And there are also ways in which more classical works, a lot of Shakespeare's works sometimes get done here in ways that emphasize um, uh, sort of political messages and political intrigue as well. So I think that's probably, there's probably some validity to that, Howard. You know, as a theater maker, you kind of know, you, you're always responding to the audience you have or the audience you want, whether you know it or not. And I think just just looking at who goes to the theater in Washington, um, you know, then then the theater the theater makers sort of respond to those to those interests. And you know, so many people who work for the government who who work in politics. I'm wondering whether that's a different dimension for the black community versus the white community in terms of what they're bringing to the what they're bringing to the space. Well, I think when we get to the um, Robert Hooks uh, DC Black Rep Company. What was really interesting and just striking were the different responses of white, of critics from white media and critics from African-American media to what was taking place. And I, I think um, one of the points that was made by, I think it was a reviewer from the Baltimore African-American was that when you go to the DC Black Rep Theater, you are, it, it is a black experience in ways in which other theaters weren't. So I, I think, there were divisions. Um, Maurice talks about, and, and certainly the group of people at Howard who were developing the Howard players um, represented a kind of intellectual elite. And they were, uh, some, some of what they were doing was geared towards, um, towards themselves, basically. But there was also um, Willis Richardson, who was, was much closer to working class life in Washington. He couldn't go to, to Howard because he didn't have enough money. And he became the first playwright to have a play produced on, on Broadway and uh, wrote a whole number of plays. And also in the beginning, the Howard Theater, um, the Howard Players, this didn't, this didn't totally last, but they would take their plays to local uh, segregated schools and perform in schools when, um, the Emperor Jones came, there was a big performance downtown, but then the play was performed in a couple of, of uh, schools uh, around the city. So there was some awareness of outreach, but, but obviously theater has always been, even in the white community, uh, a, a somewhat more um, elitist kind of endeavor. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, please, go ahead. Now, I'm just going to say quickly, I think that it definitely, as Blair outlined, um, depends on the time period we're talking about, because in the early 20th century, there was, you know, strict segregation, and um, there, even when we um, get closer to the mid-century with um, the WPA and um, support, there's still, you know, separate support for Black theaters and white theaters, and so, um, the, when we think about the Black theater and its audience, it depends on what time period we're talking about. Conversely, mm -hmm. we can think about some productions that are currently happening in DC theaters that are meant to attract Black audiences or are written by Black playwrights and directed by Black directors, but are happening within traditional white um, regional theaters. And how that's a different context for understanding Black audiences than we might think of in a segregated context. Or, or again, and the development of the regional theater scene, which you might see as a sort of bridge category 
We were trying to figure out how to desegregate audiences. We were trying to figure out how to engage with the diversity of DC, how we might understand audience cultivation production and in that time period. I have so many questions for all of you. Uh, my, my mind is exploding a little bit. Maurice, I didn't want to uh, cut well, you off. Well, you know, I wanted to post up because Blair, when Blair writes this, the two things, there's several things strike me. And the things that strike me uh, uh, mostly, uh, the first thing is, is, is when these theaters emerge. And if you look closely, they both emerge following major disturbances in Washington, the big ones. After 1919, the New Negro. After 1968, the Colony Theater and things like that. What is it about these events that so affect Black people that people want to express themselves in so many ways and the theater becomes one? Well, what do you think, Blair? Well, I, I think these were, um, these were in many ways traumatic events and they also signaled um, uh, how deep the di racial divisions uh, go. And uh, July 1919, uh, when the um, African American African American neighborhoods around the city were attacked by white mobs of veterans returning from World War One, um, was hugely traumatic and. What is interesting though about, about that story and, and theater is part of this, but it's only part of it. it the community organized itself and fought back. And I, I think um, these are moments after 68, this was also a moment when the community uh, self-organized and theater was part of that self-organization and self-expression. Mm. But part of, part of the, part of the, one of the things about the Wilson story that I, I think this uh, adds an important dimension to is it's not as if African-Americans were sitting around and saying, oh, President Wilson uh, is a racist. They actually engaged in all sorts of actions to try to counteract uh, the influence of, of Wilson. And I think that's an important part of the story too. And I think um, uh, I'd be interested to see what Saika and Maurice think I think there are some parallels to the last two years uh, where we see theater and the arts responding to a very traumatic moment that had a large scale community mobilization around it. Yeah, I wanted to, I'm glad you brought that up because Soyika, you were also, I think, bringing us up to date a little bit in your comments. But I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's it, one of the fascinating things in the book is to sort of look at a, a lot of the stuff about the Harlem Renaissance period and, and all of, the connections between the politics, the theater, um, then the Black Arts Movement um, in in uh, you know in in the exploding out of the '60s, and I probably missed a movement in between at least. Um, and then to look at the moment we're in today, where we're coming out of this you know what feels like another Jim Crow uh, kind of administration in the Trump years, and the emergence of these more experimental and I would say very politically radical Black playwrights. I've worked with several of them. I mean, uh, Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, Jackie Sibley's Drury, Robert O'Hara, Jeremy Harris, uh, Alicia Harris, Antoinette Nwandu. I mean, who uh, several of whom are now working on Broadway, which is sort of a, a, an amazing, um, an amazing thing. I mean, I guess my question is, I, I don't think it, I, I want to ask about the aesthetics and the evolution of the aesthetics of it. I mean, but right, I think we see history repeating itself with this thesis you're talking about, about traumatic political moments that then lead to an explosion of new kinds of, of new kinds of writing. I, I guess, I don't know what my question is other than to, if any of you wanna fill in that story or, or help us understand what might be, how the current cycle of black playwriting um, might fit into that, that tradition or that history. Well, I would say that there are two there are two ways of thinking about this. So I had the great gift. I, I wrote a short little piece around Alice Childress's Trouble in Mind finally making it to Broadway. Um, so Childress wrote Trouble in Mind. It was first produced um, off Broadway in 1955. It was optioned for Broadway in 1957, but the producers wanted her to make changes to the script, which she refused to do. And so it wasn't until this fall 2021 that the play was produced. Right, right. 
And I had a chance to interview Kathy Perkins who worked with Childress before she died. Um, Perkins is a lighting designer and designed the play that's currently at the Roundabout on Broadway. And I asked her what Childress would think about her play finally making it to Broadway. And she said she would be delighted because that was always her ambition to have her work have the broadest audience possible. But she would also be saddened by the fact that it took a black man to die for it to happen. And so she was referring to, um, you know, the spate of deaths that happened over the summer and that the uprisings that occurred in the summer of 2020 produced. And so I think on the one hand, you have the playwrights you mentioned, Brandon Jacob Jenkins, um, Jackie Silsby Jury, Robert O'Hare, Alicia Harris, Jeremy um, Harris. I would also add Erica Dickerson Dispenza, whose new play, Colored Water, I just saw at the public on Saturday. Mm -hmm. You have these artists who were creating work um, before the racial uprisings and were anticipating how we might understand the racial dynamics of our current moment. So, you know, that there are these new formal interventions they're making that I would argue are some of which are in the absurdist tradition um, and are pushing back against realism as the primary way of representing race. But then you also have this shift in producing. And that's the part that I hear you saying, Howard, around Broadway. So what does it mean that um, the uprisings of the summer results in us having seven plays by Black playwrights on Broadway this season? Um, on the one hand, one might argue that's a good thing. But on the other hand, it, it's, it goes back to Maurice's point about what types of crises um, pre present the context for Black theater to blossom, both in terms of creating work, but then also in it being produced. Yeah, it can, it, I, I don't mean to state your thesis, but, but in other words, it, it, it requires, the, the idea that it requires a high level of trauma to, to reach that point is problematic, okay. I think I hear you saying. Maurice? Well, you know, it should and it shouldn't. You, you remember that, you know, Black artists have so much. The, the, the argument that Du Bois and others presented in, 19, in the 1920s, does Black art have to be political? Does it have to make a statement to be art? And then it comes back again later on. Not all Black artists have to make this statement. It so happens that most do because they understand uh, uh, the particular conditions. I remember the first play I ever read, and I was probably late, and it was a Douglas Turner Awards Day of Absence. So I read that and I'm thinking politically. Some years ago, I read about an event, Blair, and, and so you could probably know it, uh, that, that, in, that in 1848, black slaves just got on the boat and disappeared. And I'm thinking, it's called the Pearl. I'm thinking, I wonder if Douglas Turner Award had he read that. Now probably he hadn't, probably he hadn't. But the experiences of the history of people so reflect and just keeps coming down. But the question always remains, must it happen? Must it be art? It so happens, must it be political? It most happens, it, it has to be because this is what forms their, uh, you know, the, their particular mind. So all these dilemmas are placed before the black artists, before the black theater, as they address them. And, and, and as Blair so well pointed out in the sixties, there was these debates because uh, as you know, that uh, some of the plays people produced, People were upset because they weren't black enough, they weren't political enough, they weren't anti-white enough, they weren't uh, 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 militant enough. But it, this is the question that is always going to be before us. Yeah, that I, we, one of the one of the features of the sort of aesthetic question that was fascinating to me, especially in the chapter about the DC black rap, was the importance of music and dance within the, the, the universe of the DC black rap, obviously Sweet Honey and the Rock comes out of that um, and is, is still going on to this day. Uh, two or three dance companies and major careers flow out of what we think of as a theater company. And so many of the pieces, it, what was interesting to me is that they were uh, sort of multi, a multi-entertainment organization in a way, using a variety of aesthetic strategies to uh, sometimes get at political issues, sometimes just uh, just just entertain people. And I think that you raised the question, Blair, um, about these different purposes of black theater, but really all theater faces this. D does it have to, how much does it have to speak to the moment and make a statement? And what audience is that that wants that? Is that one audience? And then is there a different audience that just wants to go to the theater to be entertained? And, um, and obviously there's a huge tradition of, of dance and music, uh, you know, and, and entertainment within, uh, within Black America going back, uh, you know, centuries. Um, I wonder whether that, 
struggle helps to account for um, the struggle that black theater has had gaining a kind of permanent foothold in DC in terms of an institution that would last as long as arena stage does or, or something like that. Uh, that may be the wrong thesis, but no, I think you both Howard, asked that, that there question. Is, there's something to that. Um, if, uh, if you go back and read the reviews in the, the uh, Star and the Post, the white papers, uh, the reviewers were often very sympathetic to Hooks's efforts, but they didn't really grasp this notion of a pageant, this notion of nonlinear storytelling, uh, the notion that there are um, that there are ways of telling stories that don't necessarily develop characters in the way in which European theater does. And these, and you could see that even though they were sympathetic, they were struggling. And this actually is an interesting difference. Um, and and, and the, the 60s and 70s really are at one level a different story. If you go back to the folks in the 20s, uh, teens and 20s, they're coming out of um, a, a very Eurocentric American classical theater tradition. Uh, several of the people involved, uh, uh, Gregory being one, cut their teeth on Shakespeare. Uh, and, uh, and there's great pressure on the Howard players to perform Shakespeare. Mm. Uh, by the time you get to the 60s and 70s, the, the kind of European notion of what theater is, is, is not on the table anymore. And, and I think that that's an important development and evolution in the story. And what it has done, and, and you also begin to see this, not just in African-American theater, but I think of um, a theater like uh, Synetic Theater, which is a movement theater, and they do silent Shakespeare uh, through movement. Well, that's an anathema to a, a number of traditional theater people, but the artists creating this come out of a kind of um, their own European periphery uh, in the Caucasus. So I, I think that there are lots of different trends here, but uh, what happens in the 60s and 70s is a breaking away from uh, a kind of notion that we need to be like European theater or Euro-American theater or white theater in order to be validated. That, there's less interest in that kind of validation. So you could, this is your field. I'm gonna throw this to you to elaborate a little bit. Sorry for the pressure. <laughs> no, I think that that's right. I mean, we definitely see um, a lot of formal intervention, innovation in the 60s and the 70s and black theater in particular um, and in the US theater more generally. Um, and this shift away from realism and this, you know, these questions around the pageant. What's interesting though, is that um, Du Bois had a pageant, the Star of Ethiopia, which I know Maurice knows um, about, yeah. um, that was staged um, in the teens. Um, so there is a, a longer tradition in black theater of, um, of innovating in form, but I think that there's a greater volume of that innovation that happens in the 60s and 70s and it becomes more of the standard, not an exception like the Star of Ethiopia was. Um, when Du Bois did it. And so you see Black artists really pushing at what does it mean to create theater? And of course, the other piece um, that the, the book draws attention to, um, and I think is an exciting shift here, is that there's a lot of conversation amongst Black um, theater artists around the diaspora. And so the traditions around incorporating dance and music have to do with this new engagement with thinking about the Black world. And this coincides very much with what John Coltrane is doing as he's looking, uh, you know, to, to Africa. But you know, it, you see, here's the thing. Uh, I once heard Sterling uh, Brown speak and Sterling Brown, you know, he was the man of the third, he, he, he went back like Zora Neale Hurston to the dialect and people criticized him. And he went to a event, he says, now I want to quote from you, the great black poet, the great black poet, I want to quote him. And then he says, Shakespeare. So you see, here's this man who understood the totality of life. And he went, and why was he saying that? Because he was going back to, uh, to, to, to the Tempest and Caliban and things like that. So did Baraka. Amir Baraka used every tradition. He used the European tradition. He studied, this man studied 
You know, he studied uh, Ocasio, he studied Hikmet, he studied all the great poets and playwrights because he was a, just a great international man in bringing this to the stage, even though he was very contentious, very cantankerous, but at his heart was, what had his heart was rhythm and the rhythm of the play and the Africanness of the play. Mm. And I'm just to mention a contemporary piece that was here, uh, Woolley brought here to Washington before the pandemic and is now on again in New York. Uh, the Movement Theater Company's What to Send Up When It Goes Down. It was just a very interesting piece because it's a, a, it's a, a series of stories in a kind of ritualized, somewhat pageant-like format. It's explicitly for by uh, black artists and by, for black audiences. They welcome wh white audiences into it um, this is Alicia Harris's uh, piece with Whitney White directing. They welcome white audiences into it, but they explicitly say at the beginning, it's not for you. We're happy you're here. And it, it, it to me, that and this whole discussion raises the question of where we are now with respect to the integration of Black theater within the larger fabric of what used to be white theater institutions like my own, um, which over time really started to be much more multicultural. And now under my successor, Maria Guyanis is extremely, uh, extremely um, multicultural. And we, I think we all applaud that. And we think that's a great thing. But the question is, what do we lose when we, when we don't have um, theater of, by, and for uh, black people in Washington, in, in the way that we at least have one example in the in the Hispanic community, the Gala Hispanic Theater, I, you know, I just I just want to raise this question of what's mm -hmm. I feel like something's lost if we're if we're just integrating everything, but that some aesthetic exploration or tradition or ownership um, can be lost. Any thoughts? Well, I, I don't but think that, these are, I don't think these are either or questions. I think it's very important that um, uh, that the notion of a black theater for written by blacks, performed by blacks for black audiences, is secure. Uh, now, I, like Maurice, we're we're both jazz people. We love the idea of traditions coming together and mixing. Uh, but, um, and, and I, I think a lot of innovation happens on the edges where different traditions meet, and that's a good thing, but, but in order for traditions to meet, there have to be traditions. And so I don't think it's either or, I think it's both and, if, if possible. Economics, economic reality may, may make that into a silly statement, but I think in an ideal world, you, you could have both but I'd be interested to see what my colleagues think. I think it's complicated because again, you know, um, there is the producing piece that in some ways can ebb and flow depending on where we are in our aesthetic taste and in our political consciousness. And I do think one of the central thoughts around having black theater historically has been because it offers more um, chances for experimentation. Historically, it has. Um, and so, you know, this again goes back to the point around some of the plays that were produced um, in the civil rights era and how they were able to experiment with forms in certain ways that might not have been as viable in a white commercial theater. I think that though, one of the things that Alicia Harris's work and Brandon Jacob Jenkins work and the others that you've mentioned has proven is the profitability of these plays um, so the question is, you know, how much trust producers will have in letting um, playwrights and directors guide the vision. And I think that you know, it's, it's, it's an exciting moment for us because I got to see what to send up. And I also, as I mentioned, got to see Colored Water at the Public. And it was one of the most diverse audiences I've sat in in a long time. Um, and you could feel the different cultural um, customs emerging yeah. <laughs> during the and expectations emerging during the production. And so it does present an opportunity for us to rethink what does it mean to be in a space together um, when you are having the production of these plays in these, in these white regional theaters. Yeah, and we shouldn't forget that the, the question of integration of audiences is an important uh, dimension of the book as well. Uh, because, you know, both of the, the white uh, theater leaders who you profile were, were leaders in 
in, in the movement to integrate audiences. Arena had the first integrated audience in uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, well, you, you, you know, just one other thing to this, you know, it Blair talks in the book where Robert Hooks, they have a Robert Hooks day. And, uh, and just a couple talks, of years ago. Yeah, a couple was, of years ago. Now, yeah. I was just looking at something that Robert Hooks said. And it just it, he's taking up speaking about the lost colony theater. And he says the ticket prices were not high. We couldn't make a ton of money off the box office. The grants, uh, uh, the grants dried up. But he says this. We couldn't get support from the black elite because they would not come to the play. You see, so here's the question. The mayor can give hooks all the awards in the world, but it doesn't mean anything unless the city puts money to try to help create a black theater. And there's no reason in the world that the city in Washington could give $50 million to $100 million to open up the Franklin building down and things like that and not support the African-American theater because there's a demand for it. And will white people come to it? Of course they will, because they won't have to come to the, the ghetto anymore. Will black people come? Of course they will. But it's necessary to have that. And it really does bother me. Whenever I look and I see a theater and, and the things there, it's never once that it's in a, a, a space that's, that, 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 that's created by uh, African-American. Places when you go to the Atlas or when you go to uh, or the Gala Theater. The Gala Theater was a black, though it was never integrated, but it was it was, it was in the black area. And you have areas downtown. You have the Lincoln Theater. It's just, it just, just, just it's going to nothing. The Howard Theater is going. They are vacant. They don't use them. And there's no reason why enlightened people can't in the city, including black people with some money, do something to open these venues. Well, I know that these are uh, really intense discussions that happen at the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities and and other places, and certainly at the NEA right now, is, is this tension between supporting, uh, you know, traditionally white-led institutions versus supporting, um, uh, you, you, you know, black and, 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 and other led institutions, and whether we can get to Blair's vision of a both and instead of in, instead of trade-offs between either or i see i think i would assume we all we all hope for that um, on this call you know i want to just finish with a little celebration though because i do think that we can tend to fixate on how long a theater company lasts um you know and we can say oh arena stage is still going but such and such a theater only lasted for four or five years hey the group theater which is the most influential one of the most influential theaters in American theater history only lasted 10 years. So I, I would like to just take a second to remind people who are tuning in or who tune in later, you know, the legacy of, of, of companies uh, like that Howard, that dream at Howard University of a national black theater. I mean, if you could just name some of the names of the people whose careers came out of that and had this enormous impact on the whole Harlem Renaissance and on and on theater in America. The same is true at Catholic University, um, just to mention Alan Schneider and Walter Kerr. Um, and the same is true at the DC Black Rec. My God, it's just it its legacy continues to this day. Can you can you all flesh that out for us a little? Yeah, if I can say something about DC Black Rep, um, because they often because it 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 folded, um, it's often thought of as a failure. But um yeah, it, wasn't I don't see it, that way. For, it wasn't a failure for the people who were involved. In fact, they just had a 50th anniversary reunion. Uh, their alumni association is really vibrant and vital. And it had all sorts of people, Lewis Johnson and Mike Malone and, and uh, Melvin Deal. We mentioned Sweet Honey and the Rock, Charles Augins. Um, just a whole bunch of people uh, who went out to New York and London and Hollywood. Hollywood who have had really successful careers for whom this was a formative experience. So, and as I note in the book, you can draw a line between some of the activities there and the establishment of the Duke Ellington uh, School for the Arts. So the it, DC Black Rep has an enormous influence, not just on Washington culture and African-American theater, but on world theater and dance and and uh yet you know when you you get snide remarks about how it only lasted a couple of years uh so i think we need to shift our focus on what success means a little bit away from some of these kind of material measures of success to look at the lasting impact 
uh, and, and innovation and the lives of the artists that pass through these institutions. And DC Black Rep is a perfect example of it. Their, their uh, 50th anniversary reunion was just inspiring, uh, just a month ago, two months ago. Uh, 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 so, so you can, Maurice, other, other historical legacy uh, points that come to mind from all those, from Howard and from... Uh... Well, Howard has such a, you know, rich history. Um, I know we're over time, but I'll just say quickly, as you've already mentioned, many of the figures that we, we know of, Alan Locke, um, um, for example, um, are on postage stamps and are, are known right. to us as canonical figures, but we don't necessarily associate with um, the DC theater thing scene. Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes came through the scene. Um, of course, they weren't living in DC at the time, but they were associated with projects um, at Howard and um, came to the salon. Um, and, you know, um, Georgia Douglas Johnson um, and others. And so it definitely was a, a space where it produced all of these well known figures, some of which we don't even necessarily associate with theater at all, like Du Bois or, or, or Hughes necessarily, but we're all part of that, that mix. Yeah, and it's. Uh, I think one of the exciting things for me in the book was just this, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, reading about these gigantic dreams that 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 theater makers had at very important moments um, in in the history of Washington D.C. and to feel as though, um, you know, some are continuing, some are continuing in name and some are not, but they're all somehow part of uh, the soil that anybody making theater in Washington D.C. and I have to say. Uh, perhaps in the nation um, is 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 part is part of whether they whether they know it or not. Um, and at the same time, I think we can give a plug for Maurice's point. Uh, we, we the city the, we want the city to invest more um, uh, to continue to invest more than they that than they do in creating that uh, that that long lasting um, DC Black Theater. Um, listen, our time is about up. Um, I just want to thank um, Soika Diggs Colbert. I want to thank Maurice Jackson and you, Blair Rubel, for lending your incredible expertise, besides the book, Blair, but all of you for your incredible expertise. Uh, I, this discussion was like, a, a, you know, a, 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 too, too much for me to uh, for me to take in, but it just makes me want to learn more and more about the history of the, the community that I've been working in. All the years. I, uh, for those tuning in, uh, I, I hope we've managed to tantalize you into reading Blair's book. And once again, it's called Proclaiming Presence from the Washington Stage. Um, you can order it online from New Academia Publishing, which is located here in Washington, D.C. And uh, I believe it's also available from Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, so again, that's New Academia Publishing. Um, great. Thanks again to all of you. And thanks to those of you tuning in uh, and to uh, HowlRound TV. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good day.